Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we're going to do a fast and loose watercolor landscape painting. It's going to fall within the realm of the Hudson River Valley uh, tonalist landscape painters. And it's going to be on a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, 140-pound cold press. Right, I'm thoroughly coating it with water so I can paint wet and wet. I'm using a large Ron Ranson hake brush, and then we will jump into the painting process. Uh, real quick, earlier today I was doing some off-camera sketches in Conte, just imaginary scenes, and I feel like that helped me a little bit um, creating these larger imaginary scenes. So just been exploring that as well as making a few pencil marks on my paper before I start uh, painting. Let's um, start things off with a little bit of ultramarine, a really light wash. Even though I'm going to go wet and wet, my process is going to be a little different than um, previous uh, paintings. There will be a little bit more pausing and blow drying later on. This is for me kind of just to mass things in and um, essentially just get a general vibe, a general feel for it. I'm going to grab some raw sienna. and a little bit of light red oxide. And just pushing it around. In this region, we'll have our water. Just putting in some horizontal strokes. We'll grab a little bit of our ultramarine blue in there. I do feel I'm going to do some lifting in these areas with my paper towel that I have in my other hand. Um, and I'm going to utilize the paper towel in order to help control my masses. Now, usually I'll map out a scene with um, raw sienna. This time I'm going to take instead light red oxide with uh, some ultramarine to mix my far distant blue, my purple. So I'm relying on aerial perspective. As things recede into the distance, they get bluer. The reason this happens is that you have um, veils and veils and layers and layers of uh, particles between you and whatever you're looking at. The farther the object, the more those layers take place and kind of filters out your yellows, it filters out your um, reds, and it eventually just looks blue. Best way to look at this and to experience it is to go somewhere where you can see a far distant, uh, maybe like a long highway or something like that, and look at trees at the very end and see how things have a bluish you uh, to them. And then as you move forward in the picture plane, you can use little tricks to get things to pop closer. Here, I'm warming it up with some raw, uh, burnt sienna. And I'm going to wind up having a landmass here, a grouping of trees in this location and then some sweeping strokes across the foreground. I'm going to grab some burnt umber, warm this up, bring it forward. 
I could use my um, siennas in this foreground as well. All right. I'm going to rinse my brush off, which I rarely do. I just kind of keep it muddy. But I'm going to backtrack a little bit and work back to front again. So I want to play around in here because I really prefer the wet and wet look. And if I can keep that without having to do uh, much um, kind of manipulation at a later stage, I would really prefer that. So using the paper towel to lift back so that we get this one coming forward so we get an S-shaped composition. Wiping back and then making that mark there again but that's just to get the uh, reflection of the mountain itself. If we put any layers in front, it's going to blend with this background one. But that's okay. I think in the dry off stage, I'll play around a little bit more there. Let's grab some more burnt sienna, a little bit of ultramarine, use that for a darker mix. that lower in the picture plane and horizontal marks for that reflection. I have another mass coming here. I'm going to go more ultramarine with this one. We'll see if we like that. I'm thinking placing some trees in this area like I had said let me just grab some raw sienna just to go for it that would pop out against those blue marks and we'll play around there comes into the foreground again edge. Probably just grab some Payne's Gray or I think I have some Lamp Black. I think that's what that, that is. Just use that darker um, tonal value to pop forward. I'm a big fan of the Hudson River Valley movement, uh, 1800s America. Um, it was painting and capturing the, um, the views within the United States. Um, part of the bigger picture worldwide, I'm not sure what the genre would have been, maybe like the picturesque. Um, and then from there in the later half, we saw the, um, the tonalist movement, which was kind of al alongside the impressionist movement. I feel like right now with the way things are kind of loosely put in, and even when we dry it, it'll have a very Turner-esque feel. So Turner was working in um, Europe, and he was what about until 1850 as well I think he was picturesque and then started painting and capturing light and exploring watercolor as oils and oils as watercolor there was like a whole bunch he did just so much different exploration I really um I'm just unfortunately not up and up on my 
Turner history. A lot of people say that every technique that a watercolorist utilizes has probably been invented and used by uh, Turner. With watercolor, um, what I gather is that originally it was for a topographical application, kind of maps or um, scenes of estates. And then I think it was also used like as sketches and preparatory work. And in the 17, 1800s is when it moved into a medium of its own. And also during that time period, in the Victorian era, there was a lot of um, using watercolor as if it was oil paint. And there's a lot of fussy people that started um, you know, trying to dictate how watercolor should be used, etc. I think that's probably when we really started seeing so many hobbyists in the world uh, painting and drawing and working on things. I mean, using the sharp edge of a credit card here that I've cut up, what this does is it does damage to the paper itself and it will backfill and create dark marks. I had um, kind of put myself into a corner with these marks uh, in the past and I'll probably have that happen here as well um, where the painting itself when I do a dry off it's going to soften quite a bit it's going to have a really nice lovely soft effect um, and kind of give me an underpainting that I'm going to work over but these marks are going to stand out um, a lot and they're gonna look really out of place. My goal is to use them in a uh, fashion where when I paint over the dried off painting and use more pigment, it then works with it. So that's the, the goal of that. Uh, foreground, I'm putting marks and textures. A lot of people will say don't put too much detail in the foreground because you lose um, the viewer in the foreground. They get stopped there and they don't go further. However, and this is my personal opinion, is that looking at master works, landscape painters, there is a lot of detail in the foreground, but tonally everything seems to be very close to each other where um, texture is there, but there's not too much tonal variation. And, um, and I think that tonal variation is what causes the bigger overview and the eye to go throughout the paper. So if I have a lot of marks here, but they're all within the same kind of value range, it makes it seem like one mass. And then upon further inspection, you can enjoy the textures there. I hope that makes sense. At least that's that's kind of my, my view and my interpretation of that. I'm throwing some stronger raw sienna in here. The paper is still wet and wet. I'm going to grab some new gamboge, gambage. I really enjoy that um, almost like a sickly mustard yellow that comes out of it. And I think it's been a lot of fun um, playing with it lately. Anywho, what I'm going to do now is do a dry off. We'll see how things lighten up. Notice how these marks uh, will look very aggressive after that. Um, it also kind of gives a kind of pen and ink sketchy vibe to it. So you might like that technique. Well, let's see what happens after I dry off. All right, so I did my dry off. Um, you can see some of the softening that I had talked about. Um, now I'm gonna grab, I think the squirrel mop. 
excuse me, if you don't have one, um, a number four rigger or anything in that range would probably work as well. Um, grabbing some ultramarine blue as a light wash, just so I can kind of show some things. With the background mountain here, I could leave that alone. I can come in with a wash into this front one. I could have omitted these mountains or put them in partially in the uh, previous part in the white and wet and come in and apply the mountains in this stage as well. So there's different ways you can go about doing this and once you create these marks you're re-wetting that spot and from there you can throw in little variations and feed pigment in for interest you can even bring a little bit of that reflection down if you want one of the issues is there's kind of a back and forth with um, the blow dryer where if I was to put a larger one up here bring that down we now have this area if I come to it that's gonna be wet as well and if I have those two meet they'll um, they'll mix and we'll start getting a blurring it might be an effect that you want you can leave a gap between them or you can do a dry off. Experiment with these different things and see what you like visually and your application of it. For example, I am not a fan of uh, the cauliflower effect. This is when you um, apply water within a wet area and it spreads out but some people like that effect. So you have to figure out how you want to go about doing it and what effects you want to use. And try the different ones, see which ones work for you. Sounds like a cat got to a piece of paper. There we go. Uh, I'm going to grab some raw sienna, sorry, burnt sienna, with some ultramarine, a little bit stronger. This is going to be for my closer mountain now. And I guess the main takeaway is play around with those edges, see what types you like. Um, you'll see like really successful painters using a variation of edges and um, meeting points you'll see rather than just a flat tone they'll feed color in um, I think a great example that I always kind of refer to is uh, Rick S on YouTube when I first started watercoloring I watched videos where he would take uh, paint a barn and initially he would paint it in or draw it in and then from there he would um, do mixtures of raw sienna and ultramarine back and forth kind of back and forth varying that uh, gray that's created between them bring down reflections into that water And since this one's a little bit closer, I'm going to feed in some darker trees, almost like a tree line right there. I'm trying to get variety and pattern, um, just a rhythm taking place. 
see. White and ultramarine with these closer trees. This closer mass. And I think that'll look interesting around my group of trees that we're going to have more detail in. there. I think I can grab probably some Payne's Gray. Throw that in. Maybe a little line of Payne's Gray in here. But since I'm using the same color and same tone in the foreground, uh, kind of the mid-ground and then further back, I'm making this object larger to show that it's closer to us. We could probably even do some scraping, getting a little bit of detail there. Um, let's again, play around and see what you like, what you want to put in, the type of detail you want. My reflection here, it's still wet, but I don't really like too much how it is kind of a little different than that mountain, so I'll put a little mountain mark over it. Next time I think I'll leave the whole thing soft in the background. Let's see, so we're moving forward. Uh, we're playing with the gamboge, gamboge here, that mustard yellow. Something I've been exploring on the palette. Um, let's mix it with ultramarine. And then as we work our way lower, Let's go dark, so we'll mix in burnt umber. Now, you could feed in a little bit of these colors here, but once again, keeping them on the smaller side so that we know that the stuff that's closer to us and larger is um, is closer because of that that size. Might paint some trees over these. We'll see. Um, another one in the foreground. I'm just going to change to the hake. been doing so much portrait stuff you know, this summer that the fine handling of the hake just doesn't really seem to be there for me lately. Payne's gray. I think we'll pull something from what I remember from a Herman Herzog painting. There was a little waterway coming through. In fact, there might have been a hunter walking up through it. Like a little stream. We might, um, here's some lamp black. See if we can throw that in here, darken these up. It's a little too bright and cheery for me. I like the darker, moodier stuff. More muted colors. Where was I? Yeah, so we might use a little bit of white gouache. Play around and see how we like that. 
Might even do some trees over this kind of um, illustrative type tree mass. It has that sloping feel, sloping feel. Let's bring some bushes up on this edge. Just grabbing some lamp black. The goal is if this was ever matted, uh, the mat would come in a little bit on each side, but we would get an overall um, painting edge to edge. And it would kind of fit in place. Percy, what you, I don't know where she is. Might be all I need for right there, but I might bring something higher here, right in this spot. I've been playing with um, some kind of pine tree esque. I really don't know what type of trees I'm painting unless it's a um, unless I'm doing something that is. Uh, cypress trees or an oak tree down in Louisiana um, I've just been playing with the pine tree and I'll kind of mark like that but this time I think I'll use the fan brush but let me do a dry off before I faint paint over this there's a gentleman that Joe Menza had showed me on Instagram and I feel bad I'm not good with names and then if somebody has like an instagram handle i don't really know what it is unless it's like andrew broussard watercolors like if they make it super easy or like Stuart Stuart davies artist you know um or i think like lois davidson is lois davidson art so it just makes it a lot easier but anyway um there's a YouTuber that, uh, sorry, Instagram follower, person that I follow, that does these small plain in air gouache paintings on location. And he has these kind of grubby, old looking uh, fan brushes. And I believe he uses it for most of the paintings. And his paintings do have kind of a like a, I don't want to say cubist, but he he uses the fan brushes for um, flat edges in different ways and just really uses them in a, in a fashion that I, I would have never had thought. And I guess it's a good example of like how it's not really the tools, you know, that make the artist. It's how the artist uses the tools itself or the, how the artist learns how to use the material. So I'm just playing with the fan brush here to put in um, the foliage. I think Bob Ross is a good example of a fan brush. I have them, but I rarely reach for them, but um, one of the things that I would always mention this, and I know it sounds like a negative, but please don't take it as a negative, is that as you paint, you're going to learn what your limitations are and what issues you have. And for me, it's um, keeping trees in this range at a reasonable size, and for me, making them look somewhat realistic. That is a big difficulty with for me. So um, the sketching to prep out paintings, the use of a brush like this as an experiment to see how it looks, all those are things of me um, knowing my limitation and seeing how I can overcome that. So keep that in mind and be aware of those things. And don't let your limitations hold you back. Um, 
you'll often notice like because with me I paint a lot of interior monochromatic scenes of forests or streams so I'll have my large trees there so I don't get a lot of practice with these types of scenes but I love them and I want to do more of them another kind of um, knowing your limitations and, and working on them to give you an example I'm a I'm a school teacher and I will be going into my 11th year in fact this week teachers will report and kids will report the following week so it's coming up but the reason I mention it this time is that um, I'm somebody who has anxiety issues you know like gets nervous about things um, and one of it was being in front of people if you're in a classroom and raise your hand or the teachers going around one by one asking you know next person next person next person I would experience um, kind of like increased heart rate anxiety with that but rather than kind of um, hiding behind that you know I'm now a school teacher and I stand in front of a classroom of people or I, I do those type of things and not let that hold me back so hopefully that wasn't too much uh, information or too much of a rant but just know that you can um, you know, fight against issues like that and things can be overcome in fact, I always mention the uh, skateboarding podcast, and you'll hear skateboarders that went on to become entrepreneurs, or artists, or um, shoe designers, and in the podcast, they'll often say how their determination through skateboarding and trying something over and over again you know, helped build that skill. Think about uh, sports with kids, uh, music with kids. Just using this guy for a little texture, it's a lot of fun. Anyway, I think I had mentioned that I wanted to um, play around with some white gouache. So before we do that, let's see if there's anything I want to kind of add a little bit more detail and marks to. horizontal lines just really keeping in mind that our water is horizontal and keeping that horizontal mark in that plane will help establish that all right I'm gonna look at it through the, the lens just so I can kind of see where everything's at fluff things up over here a little bit more I think it's interesting enough now we'll grab we'll dry off and we'll grab some um, white wash all right so after a quick hit with the blow dryer um, I always talk about with white wash or gouache in general I'll use it in a separate container uh, off of my palette because the chalkiness will get into everything else on it and it'll get on your brush it'll get in your water etc so I try to minimize it contaminating my palette you can use white gel pens uh, this is jelly roll there's a little fly round you can also um, use dr. PH Martin's bleed proof white you have a lot of different options you can play around with um, 
The good thing about the gouache is that you can mix colors into it. I don't think the bleed proof white will allow you to do that. Um, all right. So we'll grab a little bit. I'm gonna add some. white effects here, horizontal lines, see if we can get the effect of water coming down, almost going to an edge away from us. Not something I think I ever tried painting before. Um, let me see how that's looking. I think that gives a little bit of that effect. Good. I'm not going to overdo it. We have a little bit of water. Let's see how dirty the mop still is. Try to get some fresh. Just a little bright. in uh, the closer areas of this lake. If we had a bright light source, maybe I would experiment with uh, some ripples coming from that area, but I think I will leave that be. Uh, the number one rigger, I have been putting in little sailboats into these paintings, which I've been enjoying, so I think this would be a good area for that. Once you rinse it in the rinse water, you're gonna carry that over to other things. Now that I have the rigger out, let's throw some birds. throw some birds flying up over these masses. Um, the rigger, the name, comes from the fact that it's used for the rigging on sails. So you can use that there. Grab a little bit of lamp black for a little bit of variation. I had talked about the um, the fan brush and about that gentleman on Instagram using it with a gouache and how he used it for uh, different shapes and applications than I would have ever thought. And keep that in mind, with a lot of different brushes, you can get more than just the initial mark that we know it for. For example, I'm using the rigger and I'm bringing it out, creating some branch work along here. But I can take this rigger and go side brush and create different effects. And this is just lamp black. Creating some elements here. I might even put in, and this is where I started to get myself, a tree in our region here. Let me make it a little bit wider. Yep, I'm going for it. Where I always get myself, but I gotta figure it out. Tree coming up. Ground it in place. And I'm gonna give it some foliage. I might even put a little bit of white gouache along the side. I might pass over it with a um, wash of something else. Oh, 
I should say while I do this, if you ever want to follow along, you are of course more than welcome. And when it comes to signing your name, go for it. You have my express permission to sign your name to anything you do whenever you follow any one of my tutorials um, or experiments. And on top of that, you have my express permission to sell anything you do whenever you follow one of my videos. I want you guys to be successful, at least have fun and have money for art supplies. Um, and people out there will enjoy your work. And over time, you'll develop your own style and your own approach. You know, I talk about Stuart Davies, um, Dennis Sheehan, Stephen Cronin, Lois Davidson, uh, Rick S., Joe Menza, um, all these people, um, Zoltan Szabo, that I've watched, admired, emulated, and then developed my style um, based off of that, looking at this stuff. So there's no shame in that. In fact, in the Asian cultures with art, the, the way you learn is literally sitting there and copying the masters and painting what they painted. How I'm learning portrait stuff is sitting there and copying works by John Singer Sargent. So that's how you learn um, through practice, experimentation, study of others. And if you're ever able to support this channel, liking and subscribing, um, donating. Um, I had somebody very generously uh, tip on the YouTube channel the other day, and that's the first time that's ever happened. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I don't have the name off the top of my head. I mentioned earlier, I'm not good with names. I think it was a Miss Deborah, but know that I really genuinely appreciate that. And I have the Ko-Fi and the uh, Patreon, and I try to do exclusive content. Let's do a little grass marks over here. We'll start wrapping this up. We're probably about 45 minutes in, which isn't too bad. Excuse me. I really hope you enjoyed. And I really hope that there's stuff to take away from these videos. And whenever I hear somebody um, follow it along or you know, tag me on social media, I'd love to see a result. I think it was another Miss Deborah, not the same one as mentioned before. She had shared with me on social media um, one that she had followed along a few days ago. And I absolutely loved it and really made my day seeing that. So, Miss Deborah, thank you. And if I'm messing up any name, I apologize. Let's see. I always mention Rick S. and I always forget how to pronounce his last name. Let's see, do we want to leave it at that? Yeah, let's do a dry off and um, see if that's it. All right, we'll find a place to sign it. We'll just kind of hide it in here. I hope you enjoyed and I will be back soon. Let me know what you think below and if there's anything else that you would like to see. I'm really happy with this. So I will talk to you all soon. Have a great day.